Welcome to Playing with Science, STEM Games in the Classroom. I will be your host, Chris Russell. Uh, the first order of business, I've been informed, it is not MAGFest 2019. It's actually <laughs> MAGFest 2020. So please note that if you were not aware. Yeah. <laughs> well, the first thing we're going to do is just going to quick overview, meet all uh, of our panelists. We'll each introduce ourselves one by one. My name is Chris Russell. I'm a doctoral candidate at Northwestern. I research and design games, teach physical science topics, uh, primarily for middle and high school, though mostly middle school. Um, I'm Katherine Croft. I'm a neurobiologist who turned to teaching, and I also founded my own game company five years ago. Um, we make STEM games for children of all ages, and we also do research on the effectiveness of those games. Hello, my name. Oh, is this on? Hello? Hello? Okay. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ashlyn Sparrow. I'm a game designer who happened to get hired by a university and over the course of six years have managed to become the assistant director of the Weston Game Lab at the University of Chicago. And so what we do is we are looking at games, thinking of them as experimental forms and what they can do in terms of um, like so, uh, sociology, political stances in the world and thinking, can we make games for social impact? So that's what we do. All right. So. First off, I'm going to talk a little bit more generally about some of the ideas that go into making science games. Um, I'm going to be sort of trying to introduce like why would we want to use a game in science? Um, how do they function pedagogically? You know, it, are they effective, and how do we know that? And then finally, why they fail? Um, I'll be speaking mostly generically here. Um, but hopefully you'll be able to, f to, f to follow along. And warning, I will be asking for audience participation. So be ready to raise your hands when that happens. I will call on people. So why science games, all right? So there's basically, roughly, three types of pedagogical practice you can break it down. There's direct instruction. That's what I'm doing right now. So I'm talking to you, and you all are sitting there, and you're listening to what I'm saying. Uh, second is active learning. That's when you're in some ways engaged with the material in a hands-on sense. Uh, sometimes um, in a cooperative sense, sometimes not. So you might think of a, of a lab in science class. And the final is skills practice. So that's when you've taken something you've learned from the above two and you're practicing it again. The archetypal example here is homework or a worksheet. Right? So like all these three techniques are used in varying mixes in various classrooms to produce the outcome we want, which is folks learn stuff. So as it turns out, active learning is especially effective in the sciences because it tends to be collaborative, like you have your lab partner and you work together. It tend, you know, it's group oriented, so everyone does it together in the same place, in the same space. And it tends to be experimental. So it's, the, it's a space in the pedagogical context where you can test things out in a very real sense. Uh, so unlike me just telling you, if you add chemical A to chemical B, you get a reaction, you do it yourself and you observe the reaction yourself. So this instructional technique, active learning, mimics the social practice of science, which is why it is so valuable to use in the classroom, in the science classroom. Because when you have folks doing science labs, the idea is, well, they're doing something which is like the social practice of science, even if it's abstracted or simpler in some way. So games are really good at modeling that process too, but in slightly different ways. So games typically, they take rules and they use those rules to bring a bunch of discrete objects into relation. So they use these rules to model systems or, or to, and to make a suggestion of how these systems work. Uh, games always give folks a chance to interact with these systems by making a choice, by making an active choice. So for example, on you take a turn, you do an action in the game, the game has rules which will make that action meaningful and returns an outcome to you. And so the last thing here, that outcome, games valorize outcomes. So they tell you which outcomes are good and which outcomes are bad. In the most simplest sense, this could be in a score. So you jump on the head of a monster and you get 100 points. In a less simple way, you could think of a game like a LARP, where it's not, there's not a discrete numerical score, but nevertheless there's a social experience which valorizes a certain type of play. So um, games can extend on this normative classroom experimental practice in ways that typical classroom science experimentation cannot do. So games are representative art. That is to say they, they, they can represent things that you couldn't actually bring into the classroom. In the classroom you're limited by what reagents you're allowed to use, by what things you're allowed to use, but if you're representing these with cards, with tokens, with dice, 
Suddenly you can represent things you wouldn't otherwise get to have. That's very valuable. Um, secondly, games can situate cooperative and competitive reward structures. So in other words, you're, you give a social meaning to the actions that you take. Uh, when you're doing a titration, I, I, my background's in chemistry, so a lot of the examples are gonna be from chemistry. Sorry in advance. If you're doing a titration, right, okay, like you know the instructions say to add more base to the acid until something changes, right? But there's no structure that really valorizes it for you. You're just following a list of instructions and following them. Games give those instructions social meaning by making, out, by making the outcomes meaningful in some sense. And it can be cooperative, it can be competitive, it can be a number of things, but it does make it meaningful. And the last thing, which is, of course, we all know games can be fun, they can be engaging and um, something that students enjoy in ways that they typically do not respond to like a normative experimental design. Okay, so how do we make a game that does those things that I just said? So I'm giving just a brief overview here of how I approach this topic. So the first thing you do is you identify the learning goal you want to have happen. So you, you have something you want students to be able to learn after they've played your game. Sometimes this, if you're an educator, you know that these learning goals will be mandated for you and you will have to teach something, right? So that can be easy. Uh, sometimes it can be harder, like for the work that Ashlyn does, is they'll work differently with learning goals. So after you've identified what you want to do, you want to abstract key structural systems that are a part of those learning goals, things that you could represent through a rule structure. And then you represent those systems with rules, and then you valorize the outcomes that align with your learning goals. So that's a, it's a bunch of fancy words, but basically what it means is you want, when someone plays their, your game, you want the, the best strategies in that game to align with what you want players to take home from it. So, for example, if you were making a game about, uh, let's say, an example from a game I made, a game about electricity generation. You want the players, through their play of the game, to take home the message that burning coal for electricity produces pollution. So you represent that in the game by having a system which tracks pollution, a system that tracks power output. And then when players play, by interacting with those systems, they take away those things you are trying to represent. Okay, so now, in real life, we are going to think about how we would do that if we were going to make a game about the water cycle. So, does everyone here generally know what the water cycle is? Yeah, it's like literally fifth grade, you should all know. If you don't, nod and pretend like you do. Okay, so now is the participatory part. So, let's go back to this slide. I'll give you the learning goals because you're all gonna be teachers now. The learning goals is simply to learn about these aspects of the water cycle that are listed here. So water evaporates, it condenses, it precipitates, and it collects in bodies of water. So what are some of the key structural systems that are going on in this that we'd want to highlight in the game? Go ahead. These things are related. Precipitation goes to collection. Collection goes to evaporation. Yes. Everything is related. All these are connected. And how are they connected? Um, what, what's the resource that connects them all? Uh, state changes of water? Yeah, state changes of water. Yeah, go ahead. Sun. Can't quite hear you? Sun. Yes, the sun. The sun is a major input. So now we have, we've identified this key resource that are involved. There is a circular system of water. The sun is the source of external energy. It causes these things to all happen. Okay, so that gives us a basic idea. Um, how would, let's say we're making a board game, how would we represent that with rules? You earn points for every time you complete a cycle. So you get new... The goal is to get through the cycle as many times as you can until you reach a certain point value at which point you win the game. Right, so you're basically moving the water around in this cycle, and when you do so, you, it's like completing laps in Mario Kart almost, right? You get points for doing that. Okay, um, is there any other ideas how we might do that? Yeah, go ahead, put there. You could have some kind of token or something to represent energy in and energy out. Mm -hmm. So when you're phase changing, you need energy in, you have to pay, and then you get it back when it precipitates, and you release the energy. Right. So you, you're paying with energy as a currency. Energy is your currency, and the outcome is driving the system. Okay, and then do you have any ideas of how we, other ways we might valorize that system? Like, yeah, go ahead. I was just thinking you could um, introduce temperature and the fact that the difference is precipitation. Right. 
Yeah, so you can let people poke a, change the temperature variable by changing maybe the ambient radiation of the sun to change the temperature, and then have rules that then change the outcome of the cycle through those inputs that students are allowed to make. So it's a lot of these structures in the normative science curriculum are, lend themselves towards games because they set in relation a bunch of different things. And it's hard to really get it until you see it in action yourself or model it in action yourself through a, a principled abstraction like we're doing here. So another idea you might do that I thought of just now is you could ask students to predict when it's going to rain. And you get points when you predict correctly when it's going to rain based on watching a cycle of water going around. So you're sort of doing weather prediction, something everyone understands as a normative part of their day-to-day -day life, but modeling it via a simplified water cycle. Okay, so do you game, do these, does this work? Like, do we get the outcomes that we want? And the outcome that we want is a student, you know, plays this game and it leaves the game with knowledge they did not have before, typically as measured by taking a test before and a test after, right? Just like you would in school. So there is strong empirical evidence that suggests that students do learn from gameplay and that this magnitude and effect size is in line with other active learning methods. That's basically a fancy way to say that games are about as effective as doing a lab, um, which is relatively good news because labs, we, are, we already know, are more effective in the sciences especially and in the upper grades especially than direct instruction or so-called discovery-based learning, which is when I hand you a textbook and tell you to read it. Yeah, that, that doesn't work very well, it turns out. Um, but it's easy. It's, it's, um, so when do games fail? Um, and to give an example of when games fail, I'm gonna give an example from the literature. Uh, this is an early study uh, from Kurt Squire out of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, it's a book-length study that examines using Civilization uh, three as a teaching tool. So the study starts out, uh, Squire says, he wanted to be an observer in the classroom. So he wanted to just watch the, 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 you know, the students play the games and then be able to see the outcome. But he couldn't. Well, that was because you can't just throw a game at someone and hope it will work. So he wanted to observe, but the computers didn't work and he had to fix them. The teachers actually didn't know what Civilization III was in advance, surprise, and they didn't know how to play it. And the students could actually just mess around. So Squire's results are kind of paradigmatic of the way that games fail in the classroom. So they fail in sort of along three axes. So these three conditions are, the games are not situated. So the games are sort of provided just by themselves, right? You might have the students sit down, hand them their Chromebook, say go to this address, load up the game. Huh? Um, doesn't, it doesn't really particularly work because uh, students don't come to the table with a pre-existing rubric for understanding the game content unless you provide them that rubric by using a structured lesson plan, right? So the second thing is that teachers are not supported. Teachers typically do not receive a whole lot of district support for introducing these kind of novel instructional methods in their classrooms. Um, and even though not all games are necessarily digital, in fact, many of us here work primarily in, in non-digital games, um, teachers do not have money uh, and they, <laughs> yeah, and um, they don't have computers and they are also confident that their districts will not ever provide them with those things. So that's the downside. And the last is, as I mentioned, the infrastructure is non-functional. So, and that doesn't just mean computers. Um, according to Gerber and Price, which is a, a study from 2008, surveying a bunch of teachers, about 95% of teachers said that they would like to use game-based instructional methods in their classroom. But the vast majority said that they wouldn't because they expected to receive no technical support from their districts, they expected to receive no monetary support from their districts, and they expected to receive no infrastructural support from their districts. So that's the downside. And I'm gonna end on that bummer note, <laughs> but pass it on to my panelist, uh, Catherine, who will be telling you about some of the work she's been doing with designing analog games. 
for the science classroom. Yeah, and I just want to say I'm so thankful that you brought up these conditions for failure because I'm a teacher in a public high school, and I know firsthand that all of those are true. And <laughs> um, we don't have computers for every... We're not in a poor district. We don't have computers that I can actually use on a daily basis. I have to reserve them. And they usually don't work. And a lot of the digital games are made for single users, and yeah. we don't have enough for everybody in the classroom. So they're not working by themselves. They're working with someone else, and then it's not as much fun, and then they're not getting anything out of it. So yeah, <laughs> I'm so thankful that you brought Sorry, did you have a quick question? Sure, go ahead. Yeah. And that is the logistical issue. Yeah. The biggest hurdle to get over. Like you can design a game, you can design a program that's STEM related, it's fun, it teaches kids, you know, STEM through active learning. But like the fundamental structural issue of the education system is really what's holding that back. So I was wondering if you would be able to touch on that. Yeah, so I think actually I'm gonna, after we all talk for a little bit, I will ask that question to the whole panel. It was my planned first question because one of the things that happens when you're working in this area is the evidence, uh, I, I didn't give specific references, but the evidence is fairly clear, it's fairly incontrovertible, right? But the barriers are not really with that. The barriers are structural in nature. Mm -hmm. So I think all three of us have different strategies that we use to try and deal with those, with those barriers in different ways, essentially. Um, and some of them involve begging for money, and some of them involve a design, <laughs> a design practice. Um, how do I how do I make this big? Uh, I don't think I've used PowerPoint for like a million years. Press I think F five. F five. That's my uh, favorite button. Boom. What a coincidence. Yep. Thanks. Oh wow. <laughs> um, okay. So yeah. So just to remind you who I am. Um, I am a neurobiologist. I have a PhD in neuroscience. <coughs> I did eight years of research, five at the government and the National Institutes of Health um, on autism and how brains develop and synapses form, and then three in a bioinformatics lab that was a nonprofit autism lab. I loved research. It was amazing, but it wasn't a great quality of life. I never saw my children. <laughs> We're in the front row right here. Um, <laughs> So um, I switched to teaching because I was always the one teaching people in the lab and going to high schools and just you know showing off science because I loved it so much. And so my mission in life is to enhance public knowledge of science. Um, I do that through, I'm a public high school teacher, like I said, and also with my game company. Um, so I can reach kids on a national stage, a much wider audience than just the kids that I teach. So I probably teach 200 kids per year. Um, and that's that's great. That feels great, right? But it's not the the level that I want. So I wanted to tell you my experiences, and they match very well with Chris's, um, especially like games in the classroom. Because I love that you mentioned that you can't just give them a game. So this is the problem that teachers have. They're like, oh, here's a game, go play. That never works ever because the kids don't really know how to play. You don't know how to play. They don't know what they're supposed to be learning and so you you have to have a teacher there who will frame it so like when I use a board game in my classroom I'll spend the first 15 minutes kind of talking about concepts like you know prepping them for the game and then they'll play the game and then afterward we'll say okay well um, what did you learn from this or like how many of these cycles had eggs how many of these cycles had metamorphosis and so we'll we'll, we'll use the game but we have to discuss you cannot just throw a game. And um, I also want to say that most teachers are very old fashioned. And um, so another problem is that they don't want to use games because they think the kids will get rowdy and it's bad classroom management. And I can tell you the opposite is true. Um, if they're sitting there reading a book or doing a worksheet, they are way more likely to cause mischief <laughs> than if they are engaged with someone on whatever kind of game they're doing. So that's also a hurdle, is that um, convincing these older teachers um, that you, you really need to have like, a different attitude towards games in the classroom. Um, so I'm just curious from the audience, so how many of you are game designers? Okay, and how many of you, <laughs> how many of you are from um, science or tech backgrounds? <laughs> and then how many of you are teachers? Oh my gosh, oh, wow, wow. wow, look at this awesome crowd. <laughs> Um, the reason I laugh, by the way, is because these two in the front are from my company. <laughs> so yeah, they are game designers. 
Um, so let me give you, let me talk about what's happening. So as Chris mentioned, like everyone knows games are more engaging. Kids are going to be more active learners. Um, and that's been known for a very long time. A lot of the earlier research was about how games could enhance critical thinking, which is true. So especially at preschool, if they're playing games, um, their brain's going to develop more. So from like, you know, from birth to age five is what we know as like the, it's not a critical period, but it's like a, it's a phase that lends itself to kids, if, if they're enriched during that period, they'll form more synaptic connections and they'll be smarter on in general later in life. So if you throw these critical thinking things at them, it's very helpful. It's true later too, it's not just like you have to hit by age five, but um, yeah, so games, whatever you're doing, logic puzzles, um, anything like that, memory games, matching games, that will definitely enhance our critical thinking and learning in general. I think the problem has come by like trying to convince superintendents and districts to actually adopt these game systems is that do they actually make them learn? Like as a teacher, I'm still evaluated on whether or not my students pass the standardized tests. You know, and that they're always telling me, oh, you know, go deep into the learning, really just tackle the, the topics and I, I I do, but there's a reality there that no matter how many awesome labs or games or projects we do, if they don't pass that test, I get a bad evaluation. So teachers are kind of scared because they're like, is my kid actually gonna learn the water cycle? Or are they actually gonna learn this? Because I only have one day to spend on this and then I gotta move on. And I can't just play games every day, you know, they're sort of scared about that. So um, you have to align the learning content and there are a lot more studies coming out now for that very reason is just like, I think in the past five years, there's been kind of an, an explosion of people looking at this to say, hey, there is like monetary um, reason to adopt games because they are better at teaching. And, and I think that's been a, a hurdle for people. So um, I first entered this field, oh my gosh, this is like three years ago now. Um, Oh my gosh. So we, the Yale Learning Center, they wanted to make a game and test it in their summer classes. And we usually do board games, but I have interns from George Mason from their game design program and they're also proficient in video game design. So they asked us if we could make an, a video game on um, virus infection. And um, they wanted to use that and have like half of their class just do the, the regular class, like the lecture and the reading. And then the other half would get the, like the, the framework. So they get like 15 minutes of lecture, they get to play the game instead of doing the reading. And then they wrap up the lesson. And so we did it. We made this game, it's free online actually, if you want to play. Um, it's on my website. But uh, you are Ebola and you are trying to infect someone. And um, we published a paper with them in the journal Simulation and Gaming about three years ago. Um, but we did, so we looked at all kinds of different ways and they analyzed the data and did all kinds of stats on it. And what they found was that the kids who played the games more often had much higher scores on the actual test at the end. So it was an immunology course. And um, just overall, just the kids who just played a lot um, would get much higher scores than everybody else. So that was what we published basically, and if you can find the paper, it's um, on PubMed. But that's what first kind of sparked this, and I was like, hey, I wanna do this with our board games, because I do board games for the very reason that our internet never works in my school. Um, we don't have regular access to computers. And I just love that kids are actually looking at each other in the eyes and talking and communicating. Um, that's rare, as you probably, all your teachers know. They're always trying to sneak their phones out. They're always just, you know, in their own bubble. And it's so cool to see them actually engaging and taking turns or problem solving together or, hey, you know, why are you doing that? You should really do that. Like, it's, it's really good to see. So that's why I love board games for that very reason. So I had actually one of my seniors I, this is not my idea, this is his idea, but he had a senior capstone project. So he took my games and went around to different elementary schools at after school programs and, um, and daycares and things like that. 
And we have a whole variety of games. Um, but he, this is his website. This is Joe Barrett, little picture with his poster, the final thing. But we had, we have a lot of games, but he chose two. One was a genetics game called Crazy Cats. And this is one of the first games we ever made. And it's, just, it's really simple, but you roll the dice, the dice are the cat's parents, and whatever you roll, whether it's a dominant combination or a recessive combination, <coughs> If it's dominant, you have to draw whatever the game tells you for that feature, like something boring, like oval body or circle head, two eyes. But if you roll recessive, which is harder to do, you can draw whatever you want on your whiteboard. And so kids get really creative, and you get points for how many recessive traits that you get. There's no strategy in this whatsoever. Um, but I found like kids really like to play it. I, th I think it was the art aspect as well as all the chants. But um, I actually made this when my daughter's now eight. Hi. Um, but she was four when I made it, and I made it for like <coughs> upper elementary, because this is not even their standard of learning, right? They're just being introduced to traits. And um, she could play it no problem. And I was like, wow. And so I started testing all these four-year-olds. They, they loved it. And now she's eight, and actually last year I was somewhere else and I was talking to someone, some science -y thing, and she starts explaining dominant and recessive to somebody in the corner of the room, and I'm like, what just happened? You know, so I feel like, like Chris was saying, like it's a model for how genetics work, and the kids just play it a lot, and then they learn all these terms and what they mean, and, and believe it or not, in my high school, um, my sophomores, the first day I asked them, okay, who gives you most of your DNA, your mom or your dad? And they're always like, oh, that's my mom, or it's gotta be my dad. And like, they really, it's like, no. <laughs> it's half and half. I'm like, ah, oh, like they don't really, use, it's so obvious, but a lot of kids don't know that. So I'm trying to push this to younger audiences so they can learn more. Because I know as a scientist, you know, we have sequenced the human genome. We are personalized medicines, cutting edge, and <coughs> schools are way behind. So we got to get these genetics concepts in early. That's my little thing. But anyway, so he tested it, and he gave them a pre-test and a post-test on genetics concepts. And you can see the scores um, more than doubled for the kids. Um, and he tested 52 students. This is pilot data, obviously. Um, and we need like, more proper controls. But it was really encouraging to see that later on they could remember and tell you what these things meant and what, what the concepts were. Um, the same thing, we have a coding game called Tacto. It's you're playing tic-tac-toe against someone, but you have to code it. Um, and so you have to come up with these logical thinkings, and basically they're if-then statements. The kids don't, you know, we're not saying, hey, here's your <laughs> algorithm, go make your, but they're thinking like that. And so in the pretest that Joe did, we developed one where they would, we give them like a kind of logical thinking puzzles, like Joe has to go to the store. What are the steps he would need to do? And like, just things like that. And then later on, I have the same kind of like puzzles to solve. And they uh, almost tripled in their ability to do this. And this is only 18 students because he didn't get to finish his whole way. But um, <coughs> it's really encouraging to see that we're introducing these concepts to elementary kids and they're learning a lot from them. So I think there's a lot of potential going on there. Um, and some other things I wanted to mention. Oh, so Quantic Foundry, I don't know if you know about them, but they did this gamer survey on what motivates gamers to play a game. And they looked at adults, kids, men, women, there's all kinds of data for free online. Um, this one, I don't know if you can see, but this is for um, my age range in my school, like 13 to 25, is like you have to figure out what kind of games do your kids want to play? Like if I bring out, let me think, something hard. I don't know if you know Twilight Struggle. Like I can't bring Twilight Struggle to my classroom because most of them, well, after five minutes, they'll give up on the rules. They don't want rules that are gonna take a long time to understand. They don't have the patience for that. Um, and they also just want to have, it depends on the age group, but the younger ones just want to be silly and have fun and they don't mind chance. Whereas, you know, hobby board gamers who are older, they don't like chance, right? They like, they like strategy and player agency. And so you really have to figure out, who am I making this for? Who's playing this? And what do I want them to learn? So that's something to keep in mind. There's a lot of data there. And I also want to mention, like, 
I make my own from my own classrooms, and um, I go around pitching them to bigger companies. But there's a lot of mainstream games. Mainstream meaning like you could go to Target and probably find these games, or they're on Amazon. Um, they're mass produced. And these are already out there that you could use in the classroom. Some of them are harder than others, depending on who you're teaching. Um, but Organ Attack has taught more concepts of anatomy than I ever dreamed <laughs> to my anatomy students. It's like one of my favorite games ever. You have organs in front of you and you're killing each other off with diseases. And it uses, <laughs> it's amazing. And it's from the Awkward Yeti, like an online comic. And they've learned all the vocabulary for everything. They can tell you like what organ systems are affected by what. It's, it's just amazing. So don't think that, oh, I have to make my own game every single time. But there's a lot of stuff out there that you could look at and be like, oh, I could easily use this in the classroom. Chemistry Flex is a great example. Like you're making molecules and it's really good. So um, that's what I wanted to emphasize is that, um, yeah, just pick something that's suitable for whatever you're trying to teach and frame it in a way that's accessible and fun for your audience. So yeah, I just have my contact information. So um, you can email me or I can give you my business card. <laughs> So, yeah. This one? Uh, the whole. The whole juice angle. The whole thing. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And Ashley, can you pass me? I don't care who that, whose water that is. I'm going to drink it because I'm, <laughs> I'm literally dying. Get your information. Oh. Oh, yes. you want to just actually pop up after the panel? Okay. Yeah, sorry, because we're going to be fiddling sorry. with this tech for like, I don't know, however many minutes it takes. I hope not. Hopefully, this just works. We understand your teacher. <laughs> <laughs> you fight with that smart board every day. <laughs> oh, perfect. Oh, give subtitles a try. What? <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, the PowerPoint really wants us to give something or other a try. Okay. Oh, hello. Again, my name is Ashlyn Sparrow. I'm the assistant director of the Weston Game Lab at the University of Chicago. A little background about me. Um, I studied actually IT and security risk and analysis in my undergraduate program, so I was really just going to be an infosec person. Um, but I've been playing games all my life, and so I went and got my master's at Carnegie Mellon University and studied entertainment technology. So I'm like a technologist at heart um, and always cared a lot about games um, to the point where actually to like speak to everything that has been said, like I view a lot of things in life as games, and I feel like if everyone can learn all these different Pokemon or all the different like cards and magic, like why can't you do that with things that are in your everyday life and how can you just make that enjoyable and engaging and learning is challenging just like playing a game is challenging and so how do we just map those things on where it's thoughtful and interesting um, and so one project that I want to speak to um, because in my, my lab, in my previous life, um, we've done a lot of board games and card games for high school students. So we understand the pains of working in a high school, um, but just from like a person coming into the school and noticing this is not gonna work, we have to change our entire design methodology. Um, but I'm gonna talk at kind of the collegiate level of what you can possibly do to kind of change orientation and get students acclimated to a university setting. Um, and this is kind of building off some previous work, again, for high school students as well. So this the project is called Terrarium, and actually it was just, it, we, we uh, did this at UChicago, um, and this was during, uh, actually during the summer uh, before uh, the first years came to uh, campus. Um, and so there's a couple of things there. One, UChicago starts late. Uh, school doesn't start until October. So that means while everyone's friends are going to college at like a regular time of like August, September, there's an entire month where you Chicago students have nothing to do. And they are looking to like build connections and build friends before they get to campus. We're also trying to think through how might we think about diversity and inclusion and make people ha like ha form communities again before you get to campus. But also you Chicago's really like a, the, the tagline is this is a place where fun comes to die which is like strange but it's 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 a whole thing. It's a whole thing. There are shirts and like you Chicago students for some reason are kind of proud about that. But what I'd say is that it's a place where different fun 
this happens, right? And so students are always like thinking and trying to challenge one another. And so we thought, well, how might we also get these bright-minded individuals to actually start thinking about real-world problems? And so that's how we, we created this terrarium project. How do we get students to think of a large topic? And we focused on climate change, because it's now a, it's like a topic that now everyone's like, yes, this is happening and it's a problem. It's like, finally, great, OK. <laughs> How do we get these students to start thinking about this, but not just from a scientific perspective? It is an issue that is interdisciplinary. And since we have students who are going to be majoring in a bunch of different topic areas, we can actually start to get them to think together and actually speculate about the future. And so the Terrarium Project is a form of alternate, it's a, an alternate reality game. And if you're not aware of what that is, it's essentially a transmedia a game experience where you are not limited to one specific medium, right? Where if you're playing a video game, you usually are focused on one screen. Or if you're playing a mobile game, you're playing you know, on your phone. Or board games where you're playing with these game pieces. The game experience actually takes place over multiple mediums. Like a, a great kind of transmedia experience actually is what like Riot Games creating all of these like uh, like what KDA and, and like having now you have like a band based off of characters in this game that is actually a form of transmedia uh, storytelling where now it's like well how did this pop group come to be like tell me more about that so we're playing around with this form and trying to think through what what do people already have right because we're working with about 1800 incoming first years so and they're all from all over the world some of them have played mobile games some of them have not some of them played on consoles some of them have not right so how do we think about the medium that they're going to be interacting with so that we can then base a game around that we are also creating a game around climate change it would be foolish for us to try and have everyone play that like be required to be on campus in the summer to play that game. We are not trying to just get all that CO2 emission. It's going to happen, but we don't want to be the cause of that. So we think, OK, well, if everyone is already distributed and these students do have access to the internet in their own locations, how might we then just use the internet to play this game? And so we have constructed this large, elaborate narrative where we focus on a communication channel that's opened up between present day U Chicago that interacts with faculty and staff and other students who are, are like second, third, and fourth years, um, and then get these students to also think about something in the future. Well, what happens in the year 2049? And so we're playing around with the sci-fi narrative because we want people to start to actually speculate about the future. One issue when it comes to climate change, we're all we're really good at thinking about like the grief that it will happen, but we can't think of of of, of the future. Like what happens after 2030? What happens after 2040? We can actually use science fiction to actually speculate about that. And actually, with a transmedia game, we're all working together to co-create that future. But we need a catalyst to actually make people to start thinking about that. So we have this time communication. And so we, as faculty and staff members at the university, are saying, hey, we found this weird blueprint. This connects us to the future. We're going to try and uh, interact with the future. What is going to happen in the future? What would they tell us? If someone in the future could talk to the past, what would they say to us present day, right? To us as present day human beings. And that's the kind of narrative that we were playing with. Turns out it was terrible, future's terrible, but not a problem <laughs> because it was 2019 at the time. We can still fix it. Like that's 30 years in the future. If we make changes to what we're doing now, maybe that won't actually be our reality, right? Maybe our timeline will never intersect with that. That's kind of the idea we were playing around with. But note that because we're at a university, this is a huge undertaking, right? There's 1,800 people that we're trying to engage. And so not only did we have faculty um, who kind of were taking the lead on this, we also had game designers. I acted as the lead game designer. Um, we had a large, elaborate narrative. We had puzzles in, act, uh, in this. We also did a lot of set design for this because if we're trying to engage people through the network, we need them to actually think about what they're going to see. So we actually decided to use Twitch. 
if everyone on Twitch plays games and they show off the games that you are you know, playing, well, how, why can't you use Twitch to actually engage people in playing a game? How might we actually push forward this idea of Twitch plays Pokemon? Twitch could actually play the ter Terrarium Project, and Twitch could actually have everyone work together to think about climate change. So that's what we're going to do. Oh my gosh, we actually need to think about what people are going to see if we have people on Twitch. Not a problem. We have a theater arts and performance uh, department. Someone there will help us and figure it out because everyone is really <coughs> trying to solve climate change. Um, and so what we ended up doing was we had this kind of like black box room. We called it the bunker. And we had, stu uh, we had a narrative that had four different worlds. And, every and you would be trying to help a person get out of a room. So we're also playing around with this idea of a reverse escape room. Instead of you being trapped in a room and you working your way out, how can you help a person who's stuck in a room get out? And so how do we then build this kind of asymmetrical gameplay? And it requires everyone who's playing and on, online to work together because you kind of, like this person is like terrified and they're like, I don't know why I'm in here, help me. But you, by also talking to this person in the room, you're getting glimpses of what their world is currently like. Um, and so just kind of to rush through this because I don't know how much time, I don't know where we're at in time. Um, Take five more minutes. Five right? more minutes? Yeah. All right. So we had a high level sequence. Um, and so in kind of an Alice in Wonderland sort of framework, how do you lead people into your experience? And so, uh, we, so we had these rabbit holes, we then had the game, and then we had a futures design challenge. So we moved people from what is this experience, then playing the experience, and then using that sp experience to jump off into a design challenge. Uh, so we managed to, this is a lot of work to do, but we managed to uh, talk to the dean of the college and say, hey, in your letter that you send out to all the incoming first years, can we actually just, can you just put a link, like a little postscript, and like send them on this little journey? And if they find it, great. And, then, and he was like, yeah, okay. So, <laughs> it was wild. So, um, the letter went out and, and they saw forecast.uchicago.edu slash terrarium.pdf. And that led them to a series of websites on different departments, which led them to our website where they learned about the Futures Design Challenge. Um, and so we were also constantly watching the students as they were engaging in this because they had their own Facebook group, they had a Discord channel, and they were kind of intrigued about like why is a university going through all this effort to do something for orientation. Also it has something to do with climate change. Tell me more, right? And that is the hook that we needed to build this elaborative story. Um, we also worked closely with about 30 to 40 Chicago faculty. Uh, it turns out faculty are really, really, really willing to play with you, especially if you ask them about their research, but frame it in like 2049, right? <laughs> they, will, they will do that. They're like, oh, okay. Um, and so they ended up talking about um, you know, their research, but again, in that futuristic perspective, um, which was amazing. We have a video about it. You can find it on our website. Um, and so throughout the, the story, they would interact with the person in this Twitch stream. Um, they would learn about the world and they would help them escape. And every time they would try and uh, leave the room, they would say, you know, something simple as, you know, don't repeat the mistakes that we've done. And they would reset the future so that we would never get to that timeline. And so we did this about four different times. And each world represented climate change in a different way. The first one was literal climate change. Um, the second one actually dealt with like a totalitarian uh, police state. And what would that look like? Um, the third one was nuclear apocalypse. Um, and then the fourth one was actually overpopulation. So we, we talked about all of these world ending uh, scenarios through the lens of climate change. And then at the end, had students come together, form teams, and think about their own ways that they would solve climate change. Some people created cookbooks. They said, well, if plants are gonna kind of die off, well, what would food look like in 2049? Like, that's a great idea. That's, that is an intervention in some way. Some students created a, uh, a, a machine learning AI, and it was, it populated, it took all of this data from like government sites and then asked philosophical questions about how do you feel that, you know, the world is gonna change in like 20, 30 years and would, you know, tabulate those answers. 
Um, so yeah, so that's kind of the high level structure of the project. It was really interesting in using the format of a game and using things that people already have access to, to think about social political change. We also had interns, like had like 14 of them. So I also, I always, I always want to be like, yes, my interns, they did it. They made things happen, so. They got paid nothing and they probably worked a lot. No, no, they, oh, no, no, my friend. My interns always get paid. They I paid always. Five yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Like, no. They only worked from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. every single day for approximately six to seven weeks and got paid a stipend of about five, six thousand dollars and it's like, this is it, this is all. Two weeks of vacation, like I'm not, I don't joke around with Where was this when I was a fellow? I know, right, this is a different lab, different lab, different times. So yeah, that's it. Okay. okay, so we have about 15 minutes left. I had some questions I was gonna ask the panel, but given that we only have 15 minutes, I'm gonna open it up. And uh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Well, I would say first take your ideas and just make a prototype. Like, don't be shy, don't be scared. Just take some cardboard, take some paper, take some markers, and make something. And then you can play it, like, with yourself, with your friends, and just see, is, is this good? Is this working? Do I like it? And, like, if you see potential in there, then you start to make more and more polished prototypes. And so, I don't know if you know about the site Game Crafter. Yeah, Game, yeah. Game Crafter is Game Crafter the place is we use. Yeah. Nice. So, yeah. there's another one now, like print and play or something? Well, you can also go down to the Riverview and just have some of the yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but like once you think you have, like you've worked out the mechanics, it's going pretty well, then you make like your beta prototype, you can go to Game Crafter. I think it's thegamecrafter.com. Um, yeah, there's a the in front of it. And you can pretty much order any piece, any board, any type of cards. You just upload the art that you have. Yeah, it's um, expensive, but it looks off the shelf. Yeah. Um. And so then you have this nice looking polished thing. I would still test it with more people, like test many times, often, and start to test with strangers. So like there's different levels of testing, right? So like the first level you're there in the room kind of helping them like another level will be like you're not there at all you just leave the instructions and see how it goes um like i know like matt leacock videotapes he sends them all around the world and he videotapes them all and then watches the recordings and makes like meticulous notes on how engaged people are like what happened like what kind of turn they took all all kinds of things and so once you play test until you're not getting any more like positive returns on it like if you're like I mean, you can always change a game all the time and make it better, but like, unless there's any more significant changes to be made, you're like, okay, I'm, I'm pretty good with what I have. Then you start making the rounds of all the conventions and you can request a meeting beforehand. I would definitely do it beforehand, like a few weeks beforehand. So what kind of convention? Um, well, there's Gen Con, it's the biggest one in August in Indianapolis. PAX Unplugged. Yeah, PAX Unplugged. There's Origins, which Connect I think is in June. Um, <laughs> what else? There's so many. There's Geekway to the West in St. Louis. That's a big one. Um, yeah. Yes. And, and Gen Con is actually doing an analog games for education track. Mm -hmm. uh, this upcoming year. That's pretty exciting. Yeah, it's a new thing they're doing this year. So yeah, and then you make a meeting beforehand. Uh, definitely like a few weeks, reach out to whoever the contact is or whoever might be there. And they'll, I mean, most of them are really happy to meet with you and they'll slot like maybe 15 minutes for you. And then you have 15 minutes to, to pitch the game. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when you say make a meeting, make a meeting with like a game company. Yeah, like if I was pitching the game right, I would find out the game right, like game development person, and I would send them an email and be like, can I make an appointment with you at Gen Con? Um, <coughs> I'm available these days. And they're like, sure, how about three? And then you, but just know, like they are seeing people all day long. Right. 
So you better have your little elevator speech feel. <laughs> like, yeah, and like what, what is, what's the hook to your game? Like what's so unique about it? And you have to really be passionate because um, a lot, I see a lot of people, like I'm waiting to pitch, right? And I see a lot of people who are just not excited about their game. <laughs> uh, well, it's not coming across. So like, if you don't love it, why would I love it? So. <laughs> um, and another thing to mention, just real, <laughs> just, just real quick, is a lot of the, I know most of these I know are for STEM, but uh, NEA and most of the teaching organizations do have small grant programs for individualized educators who are doing some sort of like inventive thing. Mm -hmm. That's something that can come cover production. I have a couple friends who've done that. If their grants are small, you know, they're like in the, like a thousand bucks, but that's a thousand bucks, right? That'll get you pretty far. That'll get you pretty far. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so I do a lot of physics and math work, and so a lot of the stuff that you uh, talked about was very concept, like learning a concept. Um, my students generally can speak things out, but then when you stick them in front of like, here is a problem where you have to apply what you've learned, they flail. And so I'm not sure how you would take a game where there are like quantitative aspects that they need to know to sort of tweak it rather than just saying this is what's going on in the general. Uh, birds I view sort of thing, you know? Right, so you're saying that like uh, from they the hot... speak it out, but then when you stick them in front of like an assessment, it doesn't happen. Yeah, they, they, they can't reapply those skills in a re... Right. I mean, in a recontextualized so sense. I don't know if you have advice for more yeah. skills. Yeah, so, th so that's, sort of, that's sort of like the, the, the homework test gap um, where the examples on the homework are simple, are, simple enough that the, the student can answer it, then once they have to apply or combine skills on a test environment, it becomes extraordinarily difficult for the student to do. Um, one of the ways that games can be functional in this way, and this involves a very intentional design, is to, you know, the concept of a tutorial level, right? So like in a game context, games are like tests in the sense that you have to perform and the outcome of your performance is valorized, but they're also not like tests in the sense that you're not getting a letter grade, right, out of it. So in a, a game like Challenge 24 maybe, or um, a game, oh, what's another good example? Code Turtles is another good example of a game like this. They start off very simple and then they're designed to do that sort of conceptual bridging, the scaffolding you're talking about, where you take a base concept and then you encounter it in different sites and different sites and you expand your sphere of, of knowledge until you can hopefully apply these discrete um, uh, you know, patterns in, in different places. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, that's extraordinarily difficult, that scaffolding work. So, and the game has to be intentionally designed in order to le allow students to start at point A, go to point B, and then learn to do point A and point B at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, 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 it's difficult. Yeah, I'm just gonna go from the front back, basically, so, go ahead. Uh, I think there was an allusion earlier to correlation and causation. Is there data that draws a line between kids who play these games who get good scores, or is there maybe some other attribute that you know, makes a kid good at doing tests <coughs> that attracts them to video games? Yeah, yeah, so th th that's a good question. And uh, study design is, of course, a serious problem in all the social sciences. Um, Generally speaking, the, the literature that I'm referencing is mostly from large meta-studies. So they exclude, meta-studies exclude all trials that aren't randomly, randomly selected control trials. So where hopefully you're not just, essentially, you're not just testing to see whether kids are already into video games because they like computers and therefore they're better at math, right? You're doing randomized controls, comparing it to a test case to avoid that issue. So the evidence for games is very robust in that sense, which is to say that there's a large basis of random, of RCTs that do support learning outcomes for games. And it's now unproblematic in the education literature to say that games are a form of active learning, right? They are another kind of active learning. And active learning is also a known quantity. So again, there's a large body of literature that shows that in certain domains, especially the sciences, and especially in the upper divisions, uh, active learning is, is tied to, the, to, to better effect sizes than direct instruction. Um, so the evidence is quite strong, and now it is widely accepted that games are, do count as active learning. That doesn't mean that all games work, of course. They're quite the opposite, right? Um, in most of the studies that are included in big meta studies are purpose-built games. 
so they're not off the shelf stuff. Like that's why I gave that example of Kurt Squire trying to use Civilization Three, and it was a mess, right? Because you can't just do that, right? Uh, purpose built and intentional design is really critical to getting quality results that, that you want, which is one of the reasons why it's so difficult to actually do this whole thing. Plus, funny, funny side note, well, so some version of Civ has Gandhi able to like blow up the world. Yes. Yeah, so my son was convinced that he's like, why is Gandhi so aggressive? So like, it's just, be it's sure just, you It's just in the AI, man. That's the way it is. <laughs> we had to like, have a little talk. But yeah, be careful with the games. Okay. Oh, man, it's changing now. Oh, we'll go there. And then we'll go there. Uh, so I'm a physics education researcher, and one of the things I've noticed is that research that was done in sociology 20 years ago is just now being discovered yeah. by, like, deeper. And so I was wondering if there's, like, an already very well-established place that, like, game research, like, educational game research studies are published. Yes. Yeah, like, so... I mean, yeah, we published in simulation and Sage gaming. Sage is the big one, I would say. Yeah. Simulation, There's simulation another game. one. I'm blanking. But I met this this couple that runs an analog game research journal. I'm yeah, there's some stuff on analog games, but I would say the big one is Sage. Yeah. Um, they do a lot of games and education stuff. Um, but also in the mainstream education journals and um, ed tech journals, um, those, in especially in the recent years, have come to accept that games do count as something that is, is legitimate in terms of studying, and we should be and and that we should be purpose building them in the same way that we're purpose building lab interventions, um, or that they can have the same function, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but I would definitely look for Sage. Um, yeah, and I said back there. All right. So I actually had a continuation answer for the first question. Um, Misha, that was the first question, first question. Uh, so another place for uh, prototyping, for reaching out to people, and for strangers. Um, James Club, I highly recommend museums, zoos, nature mm -hmm. centers, um, and please send us your games. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, especially zoos and nature centers. I am a, I'm trying to uh, start help work with a small people trying to create a bigger movement of. Yeah, there's too much sometimes, but both are good. And uh, so at least, like, if yeah. you've got, like, a nature-focused video game or something, uh, not a, um, um, what is it? Uh, sorry. In addition to NAI, which is National, uh, or NIA, National Interpreters Association, which is all-time teachers that are informal educators, um, there's different ones like Children and Nature Network. They're the ones that are big, like very paranoid of technology, and I'm trying to convince them that it's not scary. Um, so, like, send post stuff on like our forums and be like, hey, if I have this digital thing, can I have you play test it at your museum or whatever center or something? And I will be into it. I know. <laughs> Yeah, so broadly nonprofits also in relation to that. All right, this, uh, this fellow in the back has yeah. been very patient. So, so. <laughs> the most patient. sorry, I break my own rules. Yeah, go ahead. Just to tag on to an answer to your question, um, computer science educators would love to collaborate with other teachers, just so middle school and high school kids developing games for elementary schools. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, with some kind of a purpose going on related to what they're learning. So that's an awesome way for everybody to learn not only the game development process but also. Yeah. Computer science education in public schools is also a very other difficult uh, can of worms because it's often institutionally mandated but totally unsupported. So it's, it's really difficult for, for teachers. Yeah, go ahead. So I have two questions. I was wondering how we could play the terrarium game. Oh, that's a good question. So uh, the unfortunate thing about ARGs is that they exist in a very particular time, in a very particular space, and then once it's done, all you see are like the, uh, the kind of remnants of it. 
Um, but what I will say is that the Forecast website, F-O-U-R-C-A-S-T dot com, that, that website still exists. <coughs> and so what you can actually see, um, and I was going to show this, but we ran out of time, the video that we show to all the incoming students of the faculty talking about the research, but also hearing like strange time communications that they were experiencing throughout their just general life. And so. Um, you can, you can watch that. And there are also these things called climate quests. And so as the students were trying to uncover the mysteries of the kind of time communication, which you can actually also see those videos as well, there's a Vimeo that has all of the episodes from each of the worlds online, so you can watch what happened. But there are these climate quests where we had students, um, this was kind of more like a gamification, but we had students kind of try to think through the sciences behind climate change, and then also get them to broaden out of looking at reclaiming garbage and making artwork from that, or how do you start drawing images of speculating about what your city would look like. So all of that's on the website. That's the only way you can currently experience it. Um, but yeah, me and my faculty directors have been trying to figure out ways that we can slowly take this concept and then expanding this. If we don't continue to do climate change, then thinking about other kind of large design problems like democracy. I don't know. Like, <laughs> so many possibilities. Good Lord. I know. It's uh, wild. Okay. Oh, uh, what, what follow up? Yeah. I'm an undergrad physics major, and I'm thinking about maybe going into education. I'm not really certain, and I know that you guys have done research and also education, and have experience in both. So, like, what did you think about when you were like deciding to go into education? So yeah. it's a it's a huge difference. Yeah, it's a big difference. You really have to love the students because you're not gonna make as much money, you're not gonna be as respected. You really have to love what you're doing and get, like, it's the hardest job I've ever had, but it's also the most rewarding job I've ever had. Because I can see I'm making a difference in these people's lives. And so you, you have to kind of have that soul of a teacher, I think. So I, I do research on education, right? So I straddle both worlds and, um, I would say the reason why I ended up doing that is because I wanted to do both things. So I was a chemistry education major in undergrad, and then went on into film and media studies to do the game stuff. So it was very intentional for me. But I think um, in terms of public school, Catherine's 100% right there. Um, it is kind of a sacrifice to be a public school teacher. <laughs> but I mean, I get the same schedule as my children, and you know, yeah. it's, it's a different, yeah, you get it's a better quality of life for me. And like, just because I had to commute two hours to get to my lab and. You know, it just it just depends on on what you want as your personal life goals. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I tend to work in the out of out, uh, out of school space, um, which I personally look because I know of the structural barriers trying to run these kind of game based interventions in school and seeing how like teachers are the real heroes and yet they get no respect. And I'm like, why are we doing this? But being in the out of school space had a bit more freedom for me. It does mean that you're working. Um, you know, after 3 p.m. and sometimes till 8 p.m. or you're sometimes working on the weekends because that's when the students are available. That worked really well for me because I'm a night owl. So I'm like, like 5 p.m. doesn't matter to me. 5 p.m. is like, it's like my 12 like p.m. Like it's whatever. Um, but I really went into it because after I graduated from my master's, like I love games. Like I was, I was dedicated to going into the AAA uh, industry space and I had a couple of interviews. But there was this thing of, well, like, I don't know if I wanted to continue to create the same games over and over again. And that innovation, while really large, it, it's really small. And you see the small innovations happening in these large games, which are cool. But I wanted to do something radically different. And like, there's something about the AAA space will always be there. Like, Hollywood's been around for a while. The AAA industry space isn't going anywhere. But being going into some place that's completely unknown, like, nobody knows what the heck is happening here. There's research about it. Game designers are kind of slowly entering to the space. It's like the wild, wild west. What's going to happen? And I'm like, yeah, OK. The worst thing that can happen is that, like, like I, like, games are just really weird, right? And they don't work. And I'm okay with that because I also think that there should be more <coughs> bad, weird games in the world so we can all learn about them. And then also the benefit of 
working with students. Like I've never actually worked with students until I got this job. And the number of students who look like me in the school, and they're like, you're a game designer, you know about games and anime and all these things. And I'm like, I do. And then there's this <laughs> weird thing of like, oh. Just tossing anime in there. <laughs> right, and you have to, you have to, you have to. And then it's like, oh, I needed a person like me when I was in school. And so that's the thing that kept me going because mm -hmm. they were surprised that you can design games, but you can also design games that help people as opposed to continuously like shooting people in the face. So I'm like, right. all right, like I'll stay here. And I've been doing this now for six years. Right. So that's my spiel. Yeah. Right. I think we have one last question back there and then the rest of it, we'll, we'll have to end. We're already over time. Uh, I was gonna ask, so like, I know we have like limited means to buy and purchase things and there's tons of pre and stuff out there, um, all sorts of different companies. How do you evaluate whether the game is worth buying or not? Yeah. Like, the will out. So if you're specifically a science game, a science teacher, uh, the site sciencegamecenter.org uh, mm -hmm. is a, has a relatively good concatenation of these, and they're semi-curated in the sense that you can search by grade level and um, other things like whether they're keyed to, um, to standards, uh, you know, like NGSS or Common Core. Um, and also, you know, there's ways you can filter where if they have associated lesson plans. Um, most games that do exist on the market have no research, real research to back them up, so you can't mm -hmm. unfortunately really look at that. But I would say a good way to start would be to go there, filter by your grade level, by games that meet standards, and make sure it's got someone thought about putting a lesson plan alongside of it. I think that's a, usually a pretty good intimation that enough thought has gone into this that you can adapt it for your classroom without having to labor too hard. Yeah. Most games in Science Game Center are already, are, are free or have some option to, 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 to purchase it for less. Uh, Sometimes there's, depending, there's a free print and play. Yeah, sometimes for analog games, there's print and play also. Yeah, so Mine you can always. just like, yeah, like <laughs> they'll make a version, because we're trying to attract teachers to their games, and they'll make a version you can just print out and cut out the pieces in the board. I mean, that's not every game, but some games will have things like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, certainly, so the, the nonprofit that I publish my games with, Jason Learning, offers print and play versions of the, of the games for, for teachers, as long as your district buys their service. <laughs> um, but yes, so Science Game Center is a good place to start. It has a lot of free options. Um, not a lot of places do do lesson planning right. alongside mm -hmm. of it, but if they do, again, that's a good, I think that's a good intimation that you're gonna have better luck with them mm -hmm. because it's easier to do it in your classroom. Yeah. And if you just have a friend who loves playing games, no matter what it is, which I'm that type of person, like <laughs> say, hey, uh, can you like buy this game and play it? And like, can we have a conversation about it? There's a high probability to be like, yes, yes, I will. So like, if, 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 like, if, if, like find some people who can be your allies in this. Because also, like, I don't work in schools, but I, again, I have a lot of teacher friends <coughs> who ask me to do that same thing, and I'm like, absolutely, I'm playing games. You're helping students. This is like win-win somehow. <laughs> so. Yeah, and of course it is difficult to, you, you obviously want to avoid doing the donors choose route, even though right. a lot of teachers do it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. All right, and uh, we are a little bit over time here, so thank everyone for coming. Thank you.